All right. Oh, okay. Yep. So, so what we're seeing is uh, the numbers in participants are starting to climb. So we should, uh, so in about a minute or so, we should have everybody on. So we are live now. So what we've done is I've launched uh, the, where are you located? Cool. I'm getting some feedback. I'm wondering, Doug, I'm just going to mute you and Susan. I'm just going to mute you guys. Okay, so that's clean that up. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just mute you for now and then I'll uh, unmute you in just a sec here. Oh, looks like we've got a lot of people on. This is fantastic. All right. Okay, so as we're waiting for attendees to continue to join, I will um, end this poll and I'll share the results. Uh, so what we have, it looks like mainly people from Ontario, uh, from the United States, some Atlantic provinces, uh, Alberta and BC. So we're covered all over the place. That's good. I'm gonna share one more poll and then we'll get going. So we'd like to know who's, who's attending here. What is your occupation? And I see Corey McCambridge has raised his hand. Uh, so if you have any comments, I see there's some chats. Uh, if you have any issues or technical issues, just send me a, a chat message there. So let's just see this and then we'll get started. Oh, looks like we've got representation from uh, most most groups here. We've got everyone from academia to utilities, suppliers, government, energy advisors, builders, trades. So every single category is uh, is represented here in the um, 140 people we have on the call today. I'll just share those results. Okay, good. Oh, excellent. Looks like we have a lot of builders and renovators. That's the highest number and then uh, a wide range uh, of everyone else. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for participating in that poll. Uh, so I wanted to welcome you all to our uh, four-part series. So this is the first of a four-part series called From Bleeding Edge to Leading Edge, A Builder's Guide to Net Zero. That's by Doug Terry. My name is Stephanie Coleman and I work with Building Knowledge Canada and uh, so I'm the facilitator for this session and our sponsor is Enbridge. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Uh, you'll notice that, of course, you, uh, your mics and cameras are not uh, accessible, and that's uh, to manage a bandwidth because we do have quite a number of people on the call. It, but we do want to hear from you. So uh, the way in which to do that is through the question and answer. So if you have any questions for Doug or uh, Chris, who's going to be joining us on the call, um, please go ahead and include those questions in the question and answer uh, little uh, feature that you see at the bottom of your screen. However, if you have just some general comments that are not question related or any technical issues, that sort of thing, put those in the chat. Um, the question and answer works better uh, to manage uh, uh, questions. And what we'll do is as we go through the session, uh, I'll just interrupt Doug every now and again and uh, put your questions to him. Uh, so polls, we've already experienced the polls and uh, I will do one thing. I'll just ask you just to make sure that uh, audio is okay. If you wouldn't mind just uh, raising your hand just so that I know uh, that um, you're, oh yeah, look, the number's jumping up. Excellent. So everybody looks like you can hear everything. So that's good and everything's good. All right. So you can go ahead and put your hands down. That's perfect. If we do for whatever reason, run into some you know major technical issue, I'll be in touch with you by email. Okay, so so don't worry about that. But okay, so now that's the housekeeping. We will go ahead and move on uh, to our sponsor, Enbridge. And I want to have say a big thank you to Enbridge and Susan Cudahy for sponsoring this session. And I, I no doubt, uh, I believe you'll get a lot of value out of it. So Susan, would you like to say a few words? Oh, thanks, Steph. Um, yes, hi to everybody. So on behalf of Enbridge, just want to welcome everyone. And, uh, you know, all of us today that are participating are in some way connected to providing people places to call home. And I don't believe that never before has there been a greater need for everyone to have a healthy and a safe place for themselves and for their families. And our presenter today is no stranger to providing people with homes. 
From his work as a residential builder to his philanthropic work with Project Hope, where they built a net zero ready home in three days, to his incredible work with Hope Aguavira in Puerto Rico, Doug Perry has been providing a roof over the head of so many who not only wanted it, but needed it. Now at Enbridge, our tagline is that life takes energy. And today we also know that life also takes patience and kindness and humor and support for one another. So please enjoy this offer of support to gain some new insights into the lessons learned on Doug's journey. We really look forward to participating and the ongoing opportunity to be your energy provider of choice. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Steph. Thank you so much, Susan. And now Doug is going to put up the next si slide. So uh, I, I am very excited to be able to do this, this uh, four part series with Doug. Doug is a very long time friend of mine and we've been on this uh, path uh, adventure, I guess you could say, uh, to uh, continual improvement and energy efficiency, including his uh, philanthropic work uh, over the past 15 years, Doug. I think it's been that long. So Doug is the vice president for Doug Homes in St. Thomas, Ontario. He's the past president of the Ontario Home Builders Association. He is still the OHBA technical chair. Uh, he's been a member of the CHBA Net Zero and Technical Research uh, Council for, for many years. And I was very pleased to be able to present to him the 2019 CHBA Member of the Year. And just recently, he was uh, inducted into the 2019 InterQuality Hall of Fame. So Doug, the floor is yours. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Well, this would be, oh, can, there you can go. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I was gonna say, well, this would be one of those major technical challenges, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I done did it twice there, oh my goodness. Hey, listen, thanks, Steph. Um, my wife always says that she doesn't like it when I say this, but you know, you read those credentials and I say, yeah, but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> I still got a bit more to go. Uh, you know, days like today can't happen without our sponsors. So I wanna take a moment to give a really big shout out. Thank you to Enbridge for having the faith to sponsor a webinar series based on a book that hasn't even been finished or published yet. So that's uh, kudos to them for doing that. As always, you know, the opportunity to work with my awesome co-pilot stuff is, is outstanding. I'm really looking forward to this series with you. I think it's gonna be a ton of fun. Uh, and the Building Knowledge team for providing the platform, it's really thankful for that. A uh, very special thank you as well to Patrick and Anarkan for challenging me to write the guide and keeping me focused. Uh, it's come a long way from a 40 page guide and a PowerPoint, but you know, everybody that's on the listing today, hopefully is going to get an opportunity to have a purchase of it when it's ready. So a little bit about Doug Terry Homes. Uh, we are a second generation home builder. We actually started in 1954. So I am actually junior and the company is not named after me. Uh, winner of the inaugural CHBA Net Zero uh, Home of the Year Award. That was a very nice kudos on our end. We are now a two-time Intercan Energy Star Builder of the Year, and we are the first builder in Canada to build 100 plus net zero ready homes under CHBA's net zero program. So hopefully we know a little bit about what we're talking about here. So why write a book about net zero? Well, first of all, I have done complicated, and what I found out is that complicated is in fact really complicated, and there's no easier way to get yourself into trouble than do, to do something complicated. And I really wish that, uh, we'd had something like this when, when I was starting out. But what I found is there's, there's a lot of information on what to do within the building science community and the high performance home community. But there just didn't seem to be a whole lot on why and how. And so that's stuff, you know, what I really thought we should be trying to address here is more of the why and the how of it. So a bit more of like a philosophy book. And my responsibility as I see it in writing this guide is to help builders prepare for what's coming, regardless of your beliefs in climate, right? We know governments are acting this way. We know where codes are roughly going. So it's helping builders to be able to be better prepared. And the best reason of all, man, is this guy right here. This is my grandbaby Corbin. And uh, you know, it's so much fun to have him with us and to get a chance to share a laugh with Papa. A lot of people say he's mini me. He's starting to grow to not look quite as much like me. But uh, when we both have the white t-shirt on and 
and we got the same face and the same same cheeks. It's kind of kind of funny, but uh, we got to start thinking about what's going to go on for our grandkids. And this is a huge motivator for me, right? So the agenda and objectives for today, we we'll really want to try and talk about demystifying net zero, make it accessible, make you understand that it's really not that hard. We just have to put some thought into it. It's about changing our thinking about net zero and what we should be really looking at before we get into it. It's a little bit about looking at value versus simple costing methods, because I think that there's opportunity for builders here to deliver a better product and maybe a little bit more cost effectively as well. It's a boat moving industry from bleeding edge to leading edge. Look, it's not a lot of fun when you're out there and you're the first guy doing it and you've got to invent things with manufacturers in order to be able to solve problems. So being able to get more people involved means that we're going to have better choice and more opportunity at less cost. So it's, it's really about being able to get it to leading edge where people can make some money. Ultimately, it's about creating a uh, broad market acceptance that this is the preferred brand. Net zero should be the preferred brand of how people buy homes. So a little bit about the guide and about the webinar. What the guide is, a philosophical look of why and how of net zero. It's a series of short story chapters designed to engage the reader. I want it to be easy to read, although there's a lot of, there is technical stuff in there, but I want it to be something that people can work their way through and make it easy to understand. Uh, so detail is included to complete the story, but it's it's not like you're reading a, a textbook from, you know, 500 pages. If you want a really great textbook, this guy's right here, Cold Climates by Dr. Joe Stierick. But this is the type of detail we're talking about here. That's not my book. What the guide is not, I just said, it's not a technical document with mountains of details. It's really about stories for you to read. Uh, because those other books and manuals already exist. So uh, each chapter in the book is going to have an overview of the subject, uh, desired outcome that we're trying to attain. We're going to explore a little bit on what's the benefit. I'm going to share personal experiences. I like people to see my pain so that they know what not to do. Uh, we're bringing in experts from all across industry into the book to talk about their own expert advice in the specific areas we're talking about. And then where applicable, we're going to get into some costing discussions. So uh, with the webinar, we, we're going to do a bit of that. But because of the format and the timing of it, like the book would be a, a full uh, school curriculum. So we, we can't quite do it exactly like that. But we're going to cover a lot of ground. So I'd say strap on your seatbelts and we're going to get going. So the desired outcome today is really, this is the mission statement, to help you build and sell net zero homes in a cost effective market priced and profitable manner that creates superior value for your customers. I think that's a pretty good mission. Your buyer, uh, it's typically going to be a woman, maybe one to two kids, and she's in the 35 to 60 year old range. And she's typically the decision maker in the house. Uh, and then so the question I ask of you is, does she really want to buy this? Or should we give her something a little bit nicer looking, right? Because she's going to call it home. She's one going to go there and feel really good about where she's living with her family. So this is also about changing our paradigm. In the picture you see here is a picture of myself with Carrie O'Brien at Project Hope on day one. We did that home in 39 hours. Carrie had never scheduled a home build in her life. She actually was in our planning department at the time, but she got all the trades on board and helped her with the planning of it. So it became an incredible uh, community event with over 600 uh, volunteers. It was a wonderful experience. So we decided to make the film about it. The link for the film is at the bottom here and Chef, uh, Steph is gonna share that out with you. The biggest reason why Carrie was successful with this was because she had no experience. She did not know it was impossible to do. So because she didn't know it was impossible, she was actually able to figure it out, right? And with the construction teams, with all the knowledge that they had, the concern was is they'd tell you every reason why it wouldn't work. But with Carrie, what happened was she found the one way that it did work. And that's the difference. And that's what we really wanted to look at today is changing our paradigms. So what is net zero and why should we care? In simple terms, a net zero home creates as much energy as it consumes in a year. Well, why care? Man, we've only got one planet. Earth is our only home. Our shared role in ensuring it will be safe and livable for our children's children is why I think it's important. And I love to quote this from the amazing Joe Strummer. Hey, I hear what you're saying. If you're getting that to honey, hey, then don't go killing all the bees. 
and this is our opportunity for stewardship of our planet as we as we move forward. And I want to show you that it's not that hard. So getting started, the coolest notes. If you turn us off today after this screen, at least please take this away from you. Uh, step one, what's your water management strategy? Water damage is the largest insurance risk. Now, of course, with the California fires that may have adjusted a little bit this year, but it's the one the insurance companies are most concerned with. Step two, have a clear plan for air tightness because air and water penetrations kill high performance walls. Number three, now we can start talking about adding insulation. And that's really the problem because many times we're fixating on we're going to get better performance by adding more insulation without really seriously doing a deep dive on the first two steps and getting those right. And step four, then you can add the bells and whistles. But I do implore you, keep it simple. Remember, we have a customer that's going to live and operate in this home. If you put a spaceship in the basement, they're not going to know how to run it. And they should not have to be a PhD in rocket science in order to enjoy their home. So I like simple. Okay, so as far as building your team, in my mind, there's three core areas that the team has to break out into subgroups on that then come together. The first is you need a consultant team. So you're gonna need an experienced energy advisor if you don't already have one. That's the person that's gonna lead your team and help guide you on your selections. You're gonna supplement this, especially when you go from high performance up into the net zero ready area and net zero with this solar consultant, but you've also got to make room for your HVAC designer and installer. Windows are incredibly important, so that supplier needs to be involved. I've had huge success over the years of making sure that the building officials are actually at the table and part of the decision-making process, because what I find is when we do that, they've bought in and they understand what it is we're trying to achieve, especially when we start going off book and, and I don't want to say ignoring the code, but working around the building code, because a lot of times it's alternate solutions that I end up using and getting them at the table makes a huge difference. And then last but not least is your utility. Uh, we just had a great meeting with Enbridge uh, earlier this week about doing district energy using geothermal. I'll touch base a little bit more on that later today. Your construction team has to have your site supers there. The guys that are going to like be your oversight on in the field have to have to be dedicated and involved with this. They know your company in the field better than you do. And so having their experience and, and advice at the table is gonna be very helpful. That doesn't mean you want them to lead it. They need to, need to be part of it. So you can't have them saying, no, we can't do it. It's about how we can do it. Uh, and any trade that touches that wall has to have involvement and understand the buy-in. That doesn't necessarily, they have to be there the entire time, but you've gotta get them involved because uh, penetrations kill walls, right? And then lastly, your sales and marketing team. Don't forget them. They have to sell your product and they have to be comfortable with it. And that includes even if you're using commissioned salespeople. Uh, those folks, if they're on commission, might be really concerned by this because it could be their livelihoods that they're talking about. So expect pushback and engagement is critical in order to get them on board. So we're gonna start with water management. And I know a lot of you are thinking, well, we already do water management. We're good with that. But I'm going to ask that we, we just indulge me. We're going to go through this a little bit because there's some areas of concern that I'm seeing within water management that really have to be properly addressed, especially as we get into high performance homes. So Steph, when we're asking folks, what's their water management plan? I want to ask you specifically, what do you get when you put water into a wall, an exterior wall that has Foam insulation on one side and poly on the other. It's right on the screen here, right? It's a poop sandwich. Well, I was going to give a more technical, like you'll end up with mold and rot uh, in the wall, but uh, yeah, that, that would be a good way to describe it as well. It's nice and simple, like a poop sandwich. You can remember that, right? Yeah. So just like changing that grandbaby's diaper, like nobody wants to be responsible for fixing that, right? Uh, but it's not really fair to leave it for somebody else. So let's have a plan for that. So uh, back to Dr. Joe Striebeck for half a second. Uh, rain is the single most important factor to control in order to construct a durable structure. That's great advice. So here's his top fundamental rainwater control steps. Drain the site. So that slope grade away from the building. And many times I see this not being done right. Uh, drain the ground. So foundation perimeter drain is hugely important, especially how you get rid of it. In some municipalities, you're up against the fight. I know when we were doing work in Ingersoll, they made us then pump it out above on the surface. So when you had sidewalks, they turned them into skating rinks in the wintertime. That's a really dumb idea. 
And some building officials will say, but you have to have a check valve in there or you can't do it because you don't just add the check valve and call it a day, right? You just don't want to have that water back siphon back in. I get that, but there's simple ways to handle that. Uh, then the next is going to be drain the building. So that's your roof system. And we want to take care to make sure that we're not creating blockage areas that all of a sudden you've got a ton of water coming down and dropping right onto your driveway, because that again is dangerous in the wintertime. Uh, drain the assembly the drainage plane is really important. I'm still seeing builders that don't understand how to put a drainage plane together on their houses. And that directly connects to drain the opening and, and panning your windows, the proper flashing of windows and doors. And there's a real problem there that I'm going to drain, uh, uh, get right into today. Drain the component would be next. And then lastly would be drain the material. So own the whole. This is the theory that I go by. When you look at what can happen on a wall, is managing your penetrations, especially in the main floor belt, can result in reducing your air leakage by as much as one air change per hour. It's a big number for some just simple effort, right? So you can have a huge benefit to drop in your numbers for a few hundred bucks of properly putting things in the right place. So on the left-hand side, uh, foam. Now I used to do it this way and it, it really just doesn't work. And part of the problem is, is if you look very carefully on the, the left-hand image here, you can see where the foam is up against the pipe and there's actually a crack where the foam has pulled away. So it was probably a hot day, the pipe was expanded and then the foam shrinks a tiny, tiny bit, the, the pipe shrinks and you've got a, a potential opening or an opening. And then you got these guys called brickies and you know what happens when brickies come on the job site stuff? They beat stuff up. It's not their fault. You gotta put the bricks in place somehow, right? So then, then you got an oops because if you're really lucky, it's, at least it's not sloping into the house, it's still sloping out of the house, but it's a real area of penetration. So for about $100 a house more, you can properly flash your wall openings, such as what we're showing here. And so this is actually from our house, this is how we do it. There's a couple of different products on the market, but it's important to look at, at that rubberized gasket, that's really key, and then properly flashing it in, shingle flashing effect in place. That right there is going to save you a whole heck of a lot of trouble down the road. The next one, this one kills me, is the number of builders I see that are not getting this right. So on the left-hand side, you can see that they've got their windows. It's a good window put in place. Uh, they haven't even, because this guy is actually going to be using tar paper on his wall, okay? Tar paper stuff. In 2020, tar paper. Okay, you can do it, but should you? So the next thing is there's no flange extensions on this window and how are you ever gonna connect that in, right? So what you've done is basically you've created a future rotted wall, right? Here's the challenge is that this actually is covered under our building code under CSA A440.4 and anybody that's been in a national code meeting with me or technical meeting has heard me go off on the CSA standards guys about really, you're gonna make everybody pay 65 bucks for a standard that should be just open book. Uh, drives me nuts because this is also not only in the code, but not a prescribed inspection. So the inspectors don't look for this. Some of them do, but the vast majority no, don't because it's not part of their checklist. Okay. Here's what you should be looking at doing is on the right hand side. That is a properly flashed window. There's lots of manufacturers with product out there on how to do it. It's good to talk to your energy advisor to figure out what's going to work well under your circumstance. But the basics are a pan flash, corner flash, the window goes in with flange extensions tape the sides, sorry, tape the sides, tape the top, drop your, your house wrap, and then finish that taping off. It gets tight as a tick and you're not gonna have water getting in and it's gonna be long lasting and very durable. So easy to do. So the reason why I say it's easy to do folks, because I taught two Puerto Rican grandmas how to do it in Puerto Rico that did not speak English, okay? If I can teach them how to do it, don't tell me it's hard because it's not, right? You just gotta have attention to detail with your site guys. So, Steph, I, I think I put the pedal down pretty quick on that first segment because I'm so excited to leave some time for Chris. Yeah, and actually I was thinking to myself, hmm, we should have asked this question first because maybe people will be afraid to answer. <laughs> So I'm going to I'm going to launch a poll here. It's a two part question. So we did this a little bit differently. The first question is, 
Um, are you or the builder renovators you work with flashing their windows and doors? So answer yes or no, or you're not sure in the upper part. And the second question is, would a four page guide uh, be helpful? And that would be in, uh, in the second yes or no section there. So we'll just wait for some responses here. You can see we've got a mix of yes and no's in here. Still got a few people coming in. And here we're almost 70% of the attendees have voted. All right, I'll share that because uh, it looks like it's kind of slowing down a little bit here. So what we see is that um, in the first part, are you or uh, the clients that you're working with, the build a renovator clients uh, that you're working with flashing the windows. So the majority are saying yes, so that's good. Um, about 63% said yes, and about 10% uh, said no. And then about a quarter um, have said that they're not sure. And uh, overwhelmingly, yes, a four page guide would be incredibly helpful, Doug. That's the response. That's excellent. Uh, it's so good to see that we've got some people that are paying attention here. And you know what? That gives us an opportunity to take that information back to national and, and the provincial folks as well and say, look, you know, we keep saying that this is a problem. Let's get this fixed and give some information to the people to give them a fighting chance on what they're doing. Okay, so next. Total value contribution. So this is this is a little bit of a departure from how most people think about costing. But I think it's important when we're talking about the subject of high performance and net zero homes, because there are some complications that get added or some future proofing considerations that we need to look at. And it's a little bit tough to just make the decision strictly based on cost. Although we do want to make sure we're talking about affordability and that's why value and total value contribution is important. So here's, uh, here's a good example. So you can always find something cheaper, but on the left is the Mona Lisa, which is in the Louvre in Paris, France. And when COVID's done, if you ever get a chance to go see it there, it's pretty incredible to watch the people going and looking at it. On the right, that's probably a eight-year-old or seven-year-old's attempted version of it. So you can get it done a lot cheaper with crayons, but it's not, not the same, right? That's not your, your rendition of the Mona Lisa? No, and it's not the grain babies either. He's not quite there yet. Got him a nice toolbox, but it says it's three years and up. So we got to hang on to that for a little while too. So before you're selecting your specifications, it's good to keep in mind our world is changing. And so are our customer expectations and God love us, but we've got all these shows on how to build a home and it all looks really cool how much they can do in a couple of hours uh, on the job site, which is, you know, highly, highly sponsored and, uh, not very realistic, really. I mean, I've done one blitz build in the time frame I talked about, and that was like having a baby stuff because it was ten months of planning uh, for you know thirty nine hours to deliver the product, right? But the energy programs they're really focused primarily on reducing energy consumption, and this is where I think we get ourselves into a little bit of holistic trouble here because there's limited focus on what other considerations should be looked at for a dwelling that's going to be around for hundred plus years, right? Um, so a lot of folks are going to say, well, why not just meet the energy programs, call it a day, isn't that enough? And I'm, I'm going to suggest that you could, but there's opportunity here, right? There's great cost effective opportunity for looking at it in a more holistic manner. So considering the long term impact, the long term need to address occupant comfort, indoor air quality, climate change and carbon reduction. Now, some of these things folks are really expecting to be built into their home, right? Uh, in fact, they expect it all to be included without them having to do anything at all, right? As an example, who changes your car oil anymore? I mean, I, you know, I, as a kid, I've done it, but I haven't done it in a long time, right? Um, some of you out there are probably a little bit more adept with the tools than I am, but I think the vast majority of us would say that we take it to a specialist and they deal with it. So meeting pro program requirements without looking at kick, as I call it, may not meet client expectations. And it could leave you a little bit exposed on the warranty. And the other thing is, is if you try and sell these as an upgrade, the challenge becomes, well, if it's so good, why isn't it included as standard? And that makes it a push because they're expecting it already. So now we talk about total value contributions. So too often the decision about adding something specifically specification wise that, that might be considered an extra 
is shot down because of the extra cost. And for example, looking at low solar glass, which we're gonna talk about today. So when we look at that and considering our windows, when we talk about how programs look at ratings, a lot of them look at what's called energy rating. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this today because it comes up in a future uh, one of the webinars, but you can look at energy rating versus a uh, low U value. And I'm gonna suggest that we wanna look at low, low U value, but as I said, I'll get into that later. So we're gonna select a triple gray glaze window that's gonna meet the program requirements. And here, if we look at total contribution of value here, the component we're looking at is a window with low U value. Comfort, I'm gonna give you a half a point here on that. Indoor air quality, we're gonna say it gets a point. Carbon climate, no, no. Energy, again, a half a point for a total contribution of two times, okay? Now, why? Well, here's the thing. We can check some of the boxes because indoor air quality is improved. There's less chance of mold with a triple glaze window, right? In a cold climate, comfort's improved uh, as is energy efficiency because it's less for heating and you're more comfortable. But our summers are getting hotter, especially down in the banana belt where I am, where we're also getting high heat and high humidity. So a different way of looking at this for better overall value is to look at a window that has low solar glass, right? So this is talking about what's called a solar heat gain coefficient, and it's right on the sticker on the windows when you're buying them, so it's easy to understand what you're looking for. But when you're looking at the solar heat gain coefficient, I'm asking you to consider a window that has less than 0.3. Now, you know, some folks will say, yeah, but you can't make a window work with these because it falls out of the range of what's accepted in the code, except for we got something passed a few years ago that does allow for low solar glass. And if, you, if your building official doesn't know that, then you're gonna to have to drop down a little bit until you can show them exactly where this alternative compliance is in the code. So why is it a benefit? This is gonna reduce your heat gain significantly, okay? And it's also gonna cut back on material fading so products last longer. It reduces the AC and therefore also the duct sizing because what really happens here is your AC load is what's driving the size of your mechanical system. So if you can get that a little bit more balanced, then you're gonna have smaller ACs, smaller ducting. It's gonna be better balanced overall for the heating and the cooling. If your HV contractor doesn't know this, then they're not up in the current training, which is with regards to CSA F280. So it's important because it's really fairly cost effective. When you look at the cost of this, it's gonna run about 10 points more. So on a $10,000 window package, you're gonna add about a thousand bucks more. So about 10%, like I said. So the question I have is, will your customers pay you a thousand bucks more for greater comfort on a $500,000 home? I, I think that's probably you know, a no brainer. They're actually expecting it. Here's what it looks like now when we look at your better overall value of uh, the, the value contribution. Can now you're gonna have, what's that? Can I interrupt for just a sec? Yeah. Uh, we had a, a question that came in. Um, so before we get a little bit too far, um, we had two questions actually. Who are the manufacturers, or what? Who is the manufacturer of the that rubberized uh, pipe gasket that you had shown? Uh, there's a couple of them. Uh, the ones that we use are called Quick Flash, and it should be available through companies like Home Hardware. Uh, so it's in my market, it's readily available. But if you ask your Home Hardware or other uh, lumber yard to stock it, they will. And they, they run about 15 bucks, I think was somewhere in that range, 15 to $17 per unit. And the nice thing about these ones is they're available in a variety of sizes. So you can actually stock different sizes for different penetrations. Uh, there's some really great uh, details on how to install them on what's called the construction instruction app. That's a free app as well. And the really cool thing about that is it's available in uh, illustrations and, and also videos, the different things that are on there. So great if you need to have some teaching on job site at the moment to be able to show people this is the expectation. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna be sending an email out um, with all a bunch of resources in there that includes the, the PowerPoint uh, for today and uh, CI link and other things. So uh, you can look for that. Um, the second question was, would these Windows specs apply in BC? Uh, really, honestly, I would say yes. When you start getting into tighter homes, the, the challenge becomes you have no place to get rid of high solar gain. So uh, even in BC, in the North Country, you're, you're going to have incidents of high solar gain. And uh, unless you're in an area where you're like nine months of the year in heating, then that might be a bit different. But typically, when you're in a BC climate, 
uh, you're, you're going to want to manage your heat gain because it doesn't make sense to have to run an air conditioner in January. And when you start talking about the loads that we're talking about, uh, you're going to affect your comfort in the home. So if you think about, say, a, a six foot patio door, as an example, that's equivalent to approximately one kilowatt of heating on a continuous basis that's uncontrolled. It hits it when it hits it. And so you might have a couple hours of the day where you're not able to use that room. And again, it comes back to the cost of the house. If somebody's spend, uh, spending $500,000 on a house and they can't use that room for half of a day or parts of a day because it's completely uncomfortable, they're, they're not going to be happy, right? So that's really what, oh, I'm a little bit ahead of myself, Steph. Oh, well, no, that's okay, uh, because as you're talking, you're generating more questions. So I've got, uh, just back to the, the quick flash, someone had asked if uh, flex wrap, if you could use flex wrap instead of quick flash. Yes, we have. Um, the issue with the flex wrap is it's a little bit more attention to detail, but there are certain times that it's actually a great solution. Um, I, I have really no issue with that, except for you've really got to look at your shingling carefully on how you're going to tie it in. And so what we found is that when you're using the, the quick flash and trying to get that in behind your, your house wrap, it does become a little bit of, a, of an issue with the, with the flex wrap, you know, especially on the bottom portion and then how are you taping it together? Whereas with the quick flash and using that, and again, it's gonna be slightly more money than the flex wrap, but it just does a cleaner job. And it's very easy to inspect and a lot less chance of having problems. That was a great uh, question. Yeah, and actually that what you just described sounds like, you know, when there's already challenges on the job site, having something like that that makes your life easier, um, you know, it sounds like it could be certainly advantageous. Uh, the last question that has just popped up um, is what about the, and so this goes back to Windows solar heat gain. Uh, what about impact on Teddy? High solar heat gain helps uh, to hit Teddy is the question. Yeah, you might want to rethink that then because I don't really care what Teddy's telling you. <laughs> If you have high solar heat gain and you have to put in a larger air conditioner and larger duct sizing, you're asking for trouble on a high performance home that's going to have maybe 20 to 25,000 BTUs in it for heating. That's just dumb. You, you can't control the heating incidents when you have high solar gain, right? I, I, I really, I take exception to, to trying to do it that way because it, it's not consistent. It's certain parts of the day, certain times of the year and it makes zero sense from a comfort or from a performance standard to have to have your air conditioner running for cooling. Now you can do it and I can teach you how to do that to have air conditioning running in January. And I've, I've done it when I've had, you know, a friend's party and they've got too many bodies in there, but that's not, should not be the required norm because you didn't do it right. So what I would suggest instead of using Teddy for this is there's actually a comfort standard and I'm ahead of myself again. Gosh, another really good question. Yeah, so you keep going um, and, uh, and we'll take up some questions in a little bit. Yeah, so uh, it's greater comfort and more even temperatures. That's really what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about considering how we, we make it better for the occupant. It's also about indoor air quality and climate resiliency. There's more resistant to long-term long climate warming by dealing with this up front. Uh, it's going to reduce your summer carbon emissions, which I think is important because you're not having peak loading, right? Uh, that's reducing the daytime peak loads, which is also reduced energy consumption at the highest cost load that there is, right? So to me, is that contribution worth a thousand bucks more? Yeah. What I haven't even really gotten into here is we haven't talked about the AC sizing because you can drop your AC typically by about a ton. It's a big, big change and your ducts get way smaller. Now I'm gonna spend more time on that, I think in uh, webinar three. So the next one is comfort and indoor air quality. And this is why I kept saying I'm getting ahead of myself, right? So this is a little bit of fun here, but we're gonna look at this next section here. The, the section looks at comfort indoor air quality and the trouble with comfort and when you should look for a fresh air. When would you like the fresh air? Two concepts oftentimes are intertwined uh, solving a comfort issue can often resolve an indoor air quality issue and vice versa. So we want to look for total value contribution benefits on comfort as well. And so Steph, the way I really like to show people this so that they never forget is we talk about Goldilocks. Now, I'm not talking about 
because uh, I do think she was onto something here, but I'm not talking about when she's like, you know, the renegade hooligan that's breaking stuff on people. You know, that's not really fair. And I do have a lot of empathy for Baby Bear in the story here, right? Because let's let's look at this. The guy has his house broken into, right? He has his chair broken. He gets his food eaten on him. And then he finds somebody in his bed, right? So he's there. And he, the kid's lonely, right? You know, so he wants to play with this, this little girl, Goldilocks, but she runs away on him, right? So I, I think, you know, really, when you think about this story, she's got some serious entitlement issues, right? And she doesn't respect other people's property very much either. But she was on to something, okay? And that's why globally, we now call that the Goldilocks principle, right? And so what this is about is hitting the average, hitting the norm, hitting the middle, middle decision, always the middle decision. And if we're talking about hitting for average in the middle decision or the Goldilocks principle, we're gonna satisfy the vast majority of our customers. So how do we as builders even begin to approach handling occupant comfort when it's such an objective feel or such a subjective feel, I should say, to the occupants. And really, I think it's about making Goldilocks happy. And if we can do that, then we're on to something, right? So I don't think people will forget about making Goldilocks happy, right? About comfort, that's, we got that one going. I'll wait for the, com uh, the comments to come up there. My personal experience on this though, is I have made every possible mistake on comfort. I think everyone, and I've invented new ones. And I've also realized that clients' expectations are abnormally high on this. They just expect more than you can maybe possibly deliver. At times it can feel like what's called a forlorn hope. And that's when, in the army, when the, the military would be going and the army would be attacking a, a, a castle or a fort and they'd have to breach the walls, the first guys in were considered the forlorn hope and often they were expected almost always to die. But if they, the leader made it through, then he was usually given a field advancement for having gotten through and captured the fort. So that's, uh, that's a very cool thing, but not something you really wanna do on a regularized basis. So if failure is a great teacher, I like to think of myself as possibly approaching Zen master level, because like I said, I've done a lot of this, right? There is hope though, and this is important, and Steph's going to share this around. There actually is an international comfort standard called ASHRAE 55. So the previous comment about what you should be looking for your modeling programs, I would suggest looking at this as a guide because it's going to give you a better answer. Robert Bean is a great resource on this as well because he talks about designing for occupants and I totally agree with Robert on this. So there's also another little trick that you can use and this is this comfort calculator. It's out of Berkeley's education department. It's pretty easy to understand and to use but it'll give you an idea of where you're hitting occupant comfort and then use that as a guide for decision making on you know, should I have a bigger window? Should I have a smaller window? What should my wall be? What, what helps with air tightness? There's a lot of different factors. In fact, we had a situation a couple of years back where we had a client who was, uh, the, the gentleman was Jamaican and he expected the temperature to be able to handle, you know, 28 degrees in the wintertime and not have humidity levels. And this is back when we were using double pane uh, windows and patio doors. And, uh, and, and really we could not meet his comfort expectation but it was outside of what the code norm was. And that was a great teaching moment for me because I realized the value of triple glazed windows at that point was being able to reduce humidity challenges in a home that might operate higher than the norm. And this wasn't a grow house or anything like that. He just liked his temperature a little bit higher and I can completely respect that. But in order to be able to manage that, we had to really change our paradigm. And as we have a changing clientele, this is something that I think becomes increasingly important for us. In the old days, folks would think, well, I'm comfortable because I'm wearing a sweater. Well, you know, some people like to wear shorts and a t-shirt in their, in their homes now with no socks in January and expect it to be warm with no drafts, right? So I believe that there's four key strategies that we've got to look at and master. The first one is uniform heating during the heating season. The second one is uniform cooling during the cooling season. That makes sense, right? Ventilation is really important. Dilution is a solution for a whole lot of reasons. And the use of a fresh air machine has a lot of benefits to it. So having controlled fresh air into the home is not only healthier, it helps you to have a greater comfort level, right? That stuffy overheated room in summer isn't just uncomfortable. That condition allows for bad microbes to thrive. And there is a range that I'll get into later about what levels of humidity we should be having. 
So a quick note here, some would argue that on this here list that I'm doing, because the last one is dedicated community, I'm gonna to get to that in a second, that you should consider a radon mitigation strategy as part of this, okay? Well, it, it certainly qualifies from a health standpoint and we absolutely do do that. But this list is a more universal list to look at all homes year round for both health and comfort, okay? So by, by all means, radon, have a look at it and deal with it properly and professionally. But the fourth item on here is one of the absolute most important pieces in a high performance home, and that is dedicated humidity control. So being able to get into the range of 35 to 55% and keep it there. 35 in the winter should be the low, 55 in the summer is really kind of the range of about, about where you need to be. And then looking at a whole home humidity management program. Now we are finding that we've got some outliers happening where some homes we just can't get the humidity under control even running a dehumidifier in the home on a continuous basis. So that's a, an area that we're starting to really explore. I'll get into that in a bit, okay? Uh, some low hanging fruit. Rooms with the draft are a drag. So we have to stop the drafts. Uh, rooms, uh, so controlling air leakage in that case is really important, especially around areas where people have sit and especially around outside walls. Rooms that overheat from excess solar gain, again, check your window specs. Zoning is an option, but let's start with windows with a low solar heat gain. It's a much better price point and it will provide immediate return. Cold basement floor. Well, the Cadillac would be in floor heating, but I'm telling you there's a lot of value there with subslab insulation. And we can also look at that for a contribution of value because we can use that for a couple things, right? Not only can it be improved heat conditioning, so you're, you're taking thermal mass into the home, making that basement slab a lot warmer. You can also deal with your soil gas strategy that way as well. So there's benefits there. I'm also going to tell you that thermostat location is highly important, right? And don't ever let the decor consultant pick where it goes. Just saying, I'll get into that because here we are. The thermostat location on this house right here is located in this little vestibule, okay? Now I know this house really well, Steph, and so do you, because that's my house, right? So 13 yeah. years, 13 years, it's not been on this wall here, which had a massive volume of air. It's been on this wall right here, which is a little three and a half by three and a half vestibule into my, my laundry room and my powder room. And you know what? It's got heated floor underneath of it. So you know what happens in the winter time? Yeah. That thermostat gets satisfied while the rest of my house is still cool, right? It means you got to run the temperature a little bit higher to overcome the heating that's coming from below on that floor. It sucks. Like I said, don't let the decor consultant pick where it goes. Put it on the wall it should be on, which is right here. That way you're going to avoid that phone call. Right sizing of mechanical systems, it matters. We're going to spend a lot of time on the third seminar on HVAC but you cannot size HVAC with your thumb. And I've seen guys over the years, they, they go and they stand in front of the house about 40 feet away and they do this. Oh, it's a three ton unit. Yeah, no, you can't do it that way. Cause you know what happens when you put an oversized furnace into a house? You get what's called short cycling. And Stefan wanna know, do you know this dance? I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm hot, I'm cold like this. Cause your furnace is going up and down. You, you've had that in the house? Yes, I, I absolutely have. And it's, uh, it's not enjoyable. <laughs> Not particularly, no. So we had this happen. It was so bad in this one house. We, we could not get this house under control. Uh, and the reason when we ultimately started digging into it is we found out that the furnace that was installed was almost two and a half times the size of what the house needed. It was just insane. So it heated the house like that. And the problem is, is that it overshot the thermostat set point and then it shut off. The rest of the home never got a chance to get heat because it heated the center of the home so quickly. So right sizing is gonna go a long way to resolving that. There's another piece to this that's not part of the building code, although I did really push to get it in when we went to having ECM or direct current motors on your mechanicals. And that is modulation. And it's a critical piece because what effectively that means, and you said this great the other day when we're talking about this, modulation is kind of like putting your car on cruise control, right? You get great mileage on the highway if you put the car on cruise control and just let it go, right? You get into the stop and go traffic in the city, that's what I'm talking about here, right? If you have up and down thread, you're gonna have this oscillation pattern in your hot and cold, hot and cold, right? It's not only inefficient, but it, it's not comfortable. So then the modulation helps to balance that out by having really long run times. 
and it's important that it be right sized with long run times in order to create better comfort and, and actually reduce your consumption, right? So, the nice thing about that on, on the cooling side too is uh, it, it helps with the dehumidification that you were just talking about. It can absolutely help with dehumidification. That's a, that's a great point, but only to a point as well. It can help with it, but it's not a panacea. Uh, but it absolutely will help with the comfort on, on the, the home in the cooling season. And overall, it's, it's, it should be part of your uh, cooling and your dehumidification strategy, right? Mm -hmm. Supply air distribution. This is one that we have spent a ton of time on. I remember working with Gord Cook and our old HVAC manu uh, supplier, and we were doing ducts, uh, trying to get them tightened up, and we managed to get it down to about 10%. So here's the analogy of typical duct leakage. And this is including if you're hitting SMACNA C requirements in the code. You take a bowl of water and you want to carry the water. You can carry it fairly well in the bowl, right? Right up until you say, well, I'm going to take that same volume of water. I'm going to put it into a colander. And what happens? It all spills out, right? Well, because you're trying to get to the past of the good stuff, that's why you're draining the water anyway, right? It's because you want to get to the good stuff. Maybe you're washing your vegetables. I don't really care, right? You get the idea. So that's the equivalent. Those holes in that colander are a great visual of what's happening typically with ducts. Now there's a couple strategies here. Uh, you can go beyond the smack and seed taping and do uh, the lengths of joints as well. Uh, massive coating tape doesn't really matter. They'll both work very well. The other thing is though, is you might wanna consider blowing it using like an aero seal or something like that. Or in our case, what we've done is we've gone with a completely different uh, strategy where we're using smart ducting and that's about less than 3% leakage outside of the box. When you reduce leakage, Okay, it means that you're able to put the air where you want it. You need to move a heck of a lot less of it. But again, we're going to get into that a lot more detail on uh, number three webinar. Location of supply grills also becomes really kind of important. It's really uncomfortable to have cold air blowing across your legs, especially in the cooling season, right? Or drafts that causes drafts even in the heating season when the air is not being pushed for heat, right? So you don't want to have it on your head and you want to try and avoid it on your feet. So it's important to consider how the room is gonna be used and where people will be located before you locate those grills. That's where, you know, with high performance windows and better walls, we start to have some more variation in where we can put these things as opposed to thou shalt put it underneath the window on the outside of the wall. It doesn't have to be there, right? There's different strategies that you can use such as interior high wall locations that can really help with your comfort. Rooms over the garage. Oh my gosh, is this one a tough one, right? Um, this is really where a holistic approach is gonna pay off a lot better for us, right? So a good duct design is important and we do room by room duct design with, with our whole home so we know exactly how much load's supposed to go into the room. Uh, you gotta have better windows, you gotta have better walls. You, you, you know, having the foam on the outside for continuous, continuous insulation is really important. Extremely low air leakage is, is gonna be good there. Insulating under the floor to above code is highly important. If you do all that, you can start to really make some hay here. So the rule of thumb is remove drafts, knock off the heat gain, make sure you've actually got the airflow you're supposed to make uh, into the room and make the toes warm and you're, and you're done, right? That's, that's kind of my rule on above garage design. Return air ducting is also important. So I like to do the analogy of if you've got a glass of water. So I got my glass right here and you're pouring water in here. You can only put so much water in and then it stops and then the rest of the water spills out elsewhere, right? So there's a finite amount of water that can go into that glass. If I drill a hole in the bottom of the glass, I can pour water almost forever if it's on a continuous stream, right? So what we want to do is we want to allow air to get out of the room so air can get into the room, just like having a hole in the bottom of the glass, right? Two really simple culprits on what stops this from happening. The first one is these guys are deciding that we need to have a better ceiling on the main floor. This is often happens on the second floor. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to put resilient channel on the main floor before we drop our drywall, right? Great idea, except for you, if you're pan flashing your, your return air, you just turn that entire floor into a plenum and you can't pull air from anywhere. Uh, I've had it happen and the fix is not fun because you have to take the floor up and then you have to drop a return line in to, to make that work. It's, it's not cheap. It's better than doing it from bottom up because you have to replace the entire ceiling, but it's a real pain in the backside, right? 
The second one is if somebody's trying to do a good job on the job site and they're thinking, you know what, I don't want to have any junk getting into this return here. So I'm going to be proactive and I'm going to put a piece of bad insulation into that return cavity at the floor. And then it gets boarded up. And you're going, why can't I get any air out of this? So we're, we're kind of crazy as a builder. We actually have our own duct testing equipment stuff, you know, and you've, you've seen me doing troubleshooting on these homes. And it's been more than a couple of times where the answer has been, uh, they put insulation into the return air again, didn't they? Yep. Okay. So you're opening the wall up and you're emptying that out and you're making sure. So I can see the day when, you know, doing that is, is just not going to happen anymore. In fact, there's a company we're exploring doing full ducted returns uh, over the next year or so because of the challenges it can create. Um, but that's typically the two main reasons. Sorry, go yes. ahead. Yeah, so you mentioned um, that you have your own testing equipment. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if you're not doing it in-house, um, where, where would uh, the builders go to uh, have these things tested? Uh, your energy advisor is going to help you with that, and they're probably going to have a team available to do that work. And I do recommend that you do some commissioning, uh, at least baseline commissioning, and understand where things are happening especially as you're working through your detailing on your first couple of homes to get it right, to understand where problems are going to occur, but absolutely rely on your energy advisor to do that. They can provide that service for you. And it's not that costly if you're especially using it as uh, debugging the system before you go, you know, broad numbers of homes. Um, so we've had a, a number of questions come in. Do you want to take a few questions now or do you want to keep you going? I've got time. I'm, I'm good. All right. Okay. So let's start at the top here. So, um, so going back to uh, the flashing, uh, that's been a, a interesting topic, I think, for people. So, have you used zip liquid flash for air sealing? No, I, I'm not saying that that's a bad way to go, though. Um, but typically, are, are you using a zip panel then as well? Because there are some concerns about any penetrations that are going into that, but. But there are good products on the market that you can use for that. And some of them are rated for cold weather climate as well. Okay, uh, thank you. And another question is, uh, or it's more of a comment, but perhaps you can weigh in. Uh, this person said they've tried using a dehumidifier in their 30 year old home in BC. And but because the house is so leaky, the dehumidifier is not effective. Yeah, so you, you might want to get your air leakage under control, but it's going to depend on your climate zone and how much humidity you've got entering the home as well. Um, and, and also your soil conditions. There's a lot of things that can impact upon it that a dehumidifier may just not be able to keep up with the volume of, of uh, humidity that's coming in. One cheap trick though is, but besides being a great band, is um, make sure that you pipe from the dehumidifier to your drain so that you're not having to empty the, the bin, right? because mm -hmm. that's really inefficient because you forget to do it and it's sitting there idle for periods of time, especially through the nighttime. Uh, having it on a continuous drip line is a much better approach to go. Okay, um, any thoughts on hydronic uh, heating systems with an air handler? So longer run time uh, and not as hot. Uh, yeah, I've done it. I've, I've done it quite a few times. Uh, in fact, I had it in my own house. It, it, the, the key point here is, is not as hot uh, it, there, there's definitely a little bit of acclimation with comfort, but I think in a high performance home, it certainly should be on the table. And I, I, I do think in the long term, as we start looking at geothermal as, as a major solution that we've got to consider it. But I'm just eyeing the time here, Steph, and we're almost up on two with a few slides to go here. So I'm going to put the pedal back down, okay? Sounds good. Uh, we'll come back to these ones later. Check performance. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, but I have learned over the years that a lot of these performance changes I've done have not been because I'm trying to meet a code expectation or a performance guide expectation. It's because I hate the phone call and I'm trying to make the phone call from the client stop. Uh, indoor air quality. So uh, I was really fortunate last year to attend the EVA conference in Denver and, and my now friend Gene Myers from Thrive gave me a tour around of his buildings there and to do an indoor air quality seminar. And I was shocked at the uh, effect of running a, a natural gas uh, stove has on indoor air quality. And so not against natural gas, I love cooking with it, but it's a, it's a great idea to maybe consider monitoring that or providing monitors uh, for your, your customers. Uh, a quick shout out to EBA. Um, fantastic, fantastic organization to work with for performance uh, based solutions. And the one thing I would say as well is that because there is no indoor air quality program in Canada, I think it's really time for us to have a pilot 
and a Canadian made solution. So the question I often ask Steph is when would you like fresh air? And it's really important that the right answer comes from the customers is being all the time, right? And we like to give customers two sources of fresh air. We like to give them windows that open and a fresh air machine, okay? And regardless of what the customer's initial answer, again, I want them to get to the correct answer, which is all the time. And so why is that important? Well, uh, a, a new friend of mine named Andrew Guido at Earth Homes in Toronto, he's done some really cool research on this. And what's shocking is that there's over 86,000 chemicals that are registered with the EPA in the States. And over all the many, many years, they've only banned five, okay? When we're looking at Europe, they've banned over 1,300 chemicals. That's highly important to know that there's a difference here. And we are exposed in 30 days to more chemicals than our grandparents were in their lifetime. So we're being bombarded with this. And that's why fresh air is so critically important, right? So you can use a fresh air machine. We call it an HRV or ERV. So we want to also manage our humidity a little bit. I would suggest that uh, all HRVs are not ERVs, but all ERVs are HRVs because both handle heat energy recovery, but only an ERV does moisture energy recovery as well, which is really critically important. It means you have less over drying in the winter and less over wetting in the summer. Now it doesn't resolve humidity completely, but it's another strategy into the tool book, right? I think that HVAC practitioners though have some explaining to do on this one because I've had for many years big time fights with some uh, folks in that industry about use of ERVs and also about, well, just shut it off in the summertime. Why, you wanna put a plastic bag over your head all summer? No, that's a terrible answer. You still need fresh air. That's why a dehumidification strategy becomes a separate important point. So you can start to look at besides offering a dehumidifier, Things like, you know, this is a brand, but the idea of an inline dehumidification system that's dedicated to maintaining your humidity levels. Now, you may have some issues with humidity too dry. That's an easy answer by running showers, circulating a fan, asking the client to put plants in their home or, or boil water, that sort of thing. Over drying is a critical problem because it leads to a lot of challenges. And so that's why we want to really try and maintain that. It's easy to answer. Over wetting is a bigger problem because of mold, moisture, et cetera, et cetera. So in order for us to manage the spring and fall and the high humid events in the summertime, when we get in these high performance homes, it, it may, you may find it required to look at a unit like this. And they're gonna be 1500, 2000, something like that, depending on your contractor and the size you need. Off-gassing and VOCs. A lot of times they say, well, this is a zero VOC product. And the client says, well, I want mine, give it to me. No, you got to educate them. That's a really bad idea. That, that off-gassing smell, you know, your fresh car, new car smell, that is high chemical volatile organic compounds. It's not healthy. We don't want to have that. We don't want to have it in our homes. I remember the first couple of years in our home when we were here, I couldn't keep butter in the cupboard because it kept going rancid on me. Now, that stopped after a couple of years, but that was off-gassing. Uh, so quick shout out to my other company, Graffenstone. This is the, uh, you know, the, the prepaid endorsement, if you will, uh, hashtag paint different. We have a full line of zero VOC paints and specialty coatings. They have zero formaldehyde as a preservative because they come from Europe. So they have higher standards there, right? Also has many products that absorb CO2 and they are helping to offset the, the uh, CO2 in the manufacturing process. So we are also in the process of launching a COVID elimination paint system that's available for builders here in, in Ontario, especially. You can do specialty feature walls. That's uh, actually from our model home. And that right there is absorbing uh, CO2. So we're gonna talk to Chris later about my home as a tree, okay? I don't have time for this feature wall. Well, I guess it's running anyway. It's only a few seconds. That's actually in the front foyer of, uh, of a home that we did earlier this year. Really cool what that provides. The nice thing about your paint, Doug, that's in my own home uh, yeah. is uh, you don't smell the paint. You know, normally when you go into, say, a new home or, um, you know, in, in renovation, you have that new paint smell and uh, it just, it's just not there. So it's, it's you were able to do some touch ups earlier this year. And I've heard that repeatedly from folks using that product is that they open the can and it's like they're painting with it going, I, I don't get, I don't have a headache. I don't, there's no smell happening here. That's really cool. Hey, listen, we're up against a, a, a quick uh, question here. 
Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna launch this poll question. So we talked about comfort. And uh, so the question is, this is a personal question for the attendees. Do you find that your own home is comfortable or do you think that your own home that you live in is comfortable? Okay, okay. So we're and getting I think, I think, Steph, there's another one. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll show that one in just a sec here. Hold on, back up, Sorry. back up Sorry. the bus. <laughs> Back up, back up the bus. Here we go. All right, back here we go. The bus. There we go. Um, so it looks to me like uh, we, wow, this is like the U.S. election. We have a 50-50 split. <laughs> oh. Um, to find, look at that, a 50-50 split. Um, do you think, look, it's even in blue and red. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think your own home is comfortable? So we have a 50-50 um, split on that. I'm going to launch the uh, next question is, uh, are there places in your home? So for those, um, well, for everybody, uh, are there places in your home uh, that are too hot or too cold and uncomfortable? Look at that. So what I'm seeing here, and I'll show this in just a minute when we have a few more responses. All right, so I'll share this here. So we've got 82% of the people wow. said that there are places in their homes that are uncomfortable. So, okay, so when I talk about comfort, uh, I will often refer to heated seats in the car. Uh, back 20 years ago, I was going to buy a new car. Uh, the the it, the option was to add heated seats. I was like, ah, I've never had heated seats before. I don't need it. But I was living in Winnipeg, you know. But I said, yeah, I don't need the heated seats. I ended up getting a used car that came with heated seats, and all of a sudden, my life was so much better. I had no idea how great my life would be um, by having these heated seats. And so since then, every car that I've had has heated seats. And I liken that to um, the homes uh, that we live in. And as Doug, you know, you built my net zero ready home that I'm living in. And it is by far and away the most comfortable home that I've ever lived in in my entire life. And I would not want to revert back to that, but I didn't know any better until I experienced better. And so that I think we had 50 of the 50% of the people said that they had a comfortable home, but 82% have said that, in fact, uh, spots in their home are uncomfortable. So uh, some of those respondents, in fact, didn't realize perhaps that their home was, in fact, uncomfortable. So very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, that's the benefit of a net zero home that we maybe often don't really understand is that it's providing all of these additional benefits, better indoor air quality, greater comfort, et cetera than what a code built home would be. So that's why I like to look at that total value contribution piece, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so climate resilient and carbon reduction. I'm gonna blast through this climate resiliency piece fairly quick here because we're running tight on time. So we know our climate's changing. We've got to deal with more difficult weather. A um, Couple of quick takeaways. You know, Number one, don't build on a floodplain or build on stilts. Number two, don't build in the tinderbox or adapt to non-combustible construction. Uh, number three, design and build for higher wind loads with more severe rain events. So in the past, we used to worry about keeping the roof from falling down. Now we have to keep the roof from blowing up, right? That's really what we're talking about. So right here is uh, from my friend, Sarah at Western University. She's been on a couple of Puerto Rico missions with me and they're doing the ICLR pilot project with us. It says 98% of Ontario or Canadian tornadoes are in EF2 or less. And even when you get into the super tornadoes on the vast majority of the area that's covered by that tornado, tornado the wind speed would be uh, you know, EF2 or less, right? So this is showing roughly where they're happening. And so we wanna really make sure that we understand, well, how do we build to that? So with the ICLR pilot, uh, which is Institute for Catastrophic Re uh, Loss Reduction, uh, we were looking at typical roof construction, right? Like I just said, and keeping it, uh, the roof on trying to do it for a thousand bucks or less, which was roughly where we've got it happening, right? Uh, the idea between uh, with the pilot was to transition from the research at Three Little Pigs to give them in-field production built environment uh, feedback. So like a live, live test on you know, a couple hundred homes. Three key takeaways, um, the trust to wall connection, the sheathing zones and the gable end detail. So the first one, uh, you can do a hurricane clip or you can do a screw, they're roughly the uh, same difference, right? As far as the, the hold down effect, 
the hurricane clip is 10 nails and about one minute with the nail gun and a cranky, uh, cranky framer. Uh, the screw detail, it's about eight seconds with the power driver. So here's an example right here. And I'm showing you what the, what the uh, screw looks like. I happen to have one here. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So now it's important, you know, hire framers that are six foot five or better and you're good to go, right? There's actually an extension you can use as well. You, you get the idea, right? No, I don't want to repeat that. I want to keep going. The next one is sheathing zones. The roof roughly equates into three zones. This big center zone here has got the lightest amount of load on that. That's zone one. And so when we're looking at zone one, we're talking about roughly a nailing pattern right out of the building code for your two and a half or two and a quarter inch pass load ring shank, six inches on center is really all you need to worry about. You get into zone two, that's the edges. You probably need to go down to about four inches on center. And then when you look at zone three, which is in the corners, you're into real heavy load because it's the weakest part of the wall. And at that point, you're probably best to go down to about two inches on center. So very fast for a guy with a nail gun. Uh, the next thing is, is that you really wanna try and have your, your partial sheathing is a line in the dead center of zone one. That's not always gonna be practical. So where it doesn't work, you wanna make sure you've got blocking in, and that's typically gonna be near the top, but put the blocking in so that you're attaching the sheathing together from the underside, giving it more strength. This is a real problem area, and this is typical as a scab detail. My cat's saying hi to me here. Uh, this is just basically scabbed on. That's why we call it a scab detail of a two by four to extend the roof. It is just so weak, right? And so I wouldn't want to walk on it, let alone having a roof uplift on that. Uh, it's a critical weak point. So a different way of doing it is to actually have this running right through to the truss in behind, and then it's got blocking underneath. And yes, this is Tessa come to say hi. Sorry about that, folks. Um, she, she just, what are you going to do? It's working from home, man. Uh, here's the detail. So you can see this is the outside fascia edge, and then it runs through the wall and over to the previous truss where it's connected in. That is really strong, and it's got about 10 times the hold down effect of, uh, of a, a typical detail. So that's detail is actually courtesy of Centric Engineering. A big shout out thanks to them. They were pretty involved in our trips down to Puerto Rico. And I think we're at the next poll question. Yeah, so I just launched it. And so what we're looking for here is uh, we want to know if you've been affected by extreme client, uh, climate events. So high winds, uh, flooding, forest or wildfires, uh, rising insurance uh, rates. I know I've heard that across the country, code changes, uh, municipal requirements. And if there's any other uh, things outside of this, uh, just uh, let, share your thoughts uh, in the chat section. Now, Doug, we have seven questions uh, in. So what I'm thinking we do, since I know uh, Chris is going to be on pretty soon, we could save them for the end. But if we don't have time to get to them all, then what we could do is get you to answer them and I could send them out uh, to sure. everybody. Let's let's see if we can't. Uh, let's see if we can't get uh, get going here on the carbon question. OK, this so, is, I think, really, really. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So here's the here are the results. So high wind events are uh, are some of the, the key ones. Rising insurance. Look at that. The rising insurance yeah. is uh, yeah. is right up there near the top. Okay, thanks, guys. And I think there should be a benefit for dealing with this for insurance insurance for cutting down insurance costs. Uh, so you know, stuff. You know, I, I love the smell of wood. Right, walking a, a job site and, and just when there's fresh cut framing is just so cool. Uh, I think there's a, uh, some opportunity for, for carbon sequestration. We're going to talk a little bit with Chris about, but, you know, as a kid, I went to Algonquin, local hikes nowadays, and I'll admit, you know, I like barbecue smoke. I know bad Doug, right? Got it. Got it. Uh, but anyway, we're going to talk to Chris Magwood now. We're going to bring him on. He's a director at the Endeavor Center in Peterborough. Uh, he's a director of uh, Builders for Climate Action, uh, and they're helping builders who are wanting to achieve zero carbon uh, buildings. Uh, he was also a partner in Camel's Back Construction and Design Build Firm. And I'm really excited to have Chris joining us this afternoon to provide insights on the research that he did completing his master's in the field of materials emissions from buildings. So uh, yeah, if he's ready to rip, then by all means. Hey, Chris. Yep. Hello. Hi. Hey, good to see you. Hi. Man. Yeah, this has been a great session. I've been uh, learning lots as I've been uh, listening to you. That's great. Beautiful. That's cool to get the feedback, man. I am so pumped to have you on, though. This is going to be great. Excellent. 
Okay. Um, I think it looks like we need a permission change for me to be able to uh, share my slides. There we go. Such great organization. Okay. Um, I am going to be whipping through a whole lot of content in a very short amount of time here. So uh, please kind of hold on to your seats and, uh, and I'll go through this fairly quickly. And there's always lots more follow up uh, that we can do. You can check out uh, buildersforclimateaction.org online and, uh, and there's a lot more uh, depth than what I'm going to be able to cover here. But essentially, um, what I'm going to be showing you is what the emissions associated with making all the materials that we put into our buildings uh, actually add up to. So people refer to it by a lot of different names, embodied carbon, material embodied carbon, upfront carbon, lots of different terminology. But essentially what we're talking about is the emissions that happen from the time we first start uh, extracting a raw material to make a building product. So whether that's pulling limestone out of the ground to make cement or cutting trees down for lumber or you know whatever the product happens to be. There's a whole bunch of emissions associated with, with harvesting that and then with transporting it to a factory and then with quite often a lot of emissions associated with whatever those processes are that turn it from a raw material into a, uh, into a building product. So this is uh, the term I like to use is cradle to gate. It's sort of explaining cradle being the very start of the product and gate being the factory gate before it, it, uh, it gets shipped off to, uh, uh, to you at your building site. And I'm putting the, my focus on this because over the whole life cycle of building products, typically about 70 to 80% of the full life cycle emissions happen at this sort of early phase. So it's really the place where most of the emissions happen and where you know, we as builders have a chance to uh, intervene and, and make some smart choices. So the study that Doug was referring to, um, I first started working on this because for our own design build firm here at Endeavor, I wanted to know these answers for our own projects. And in trying to get to the answer, I realized that nobody had really uh, done a deep dive into this, especially at the residential scale. So uh, like Doug said, I, I went back to school and, uh, and did a master's degree. And what I did was I, I, I looked at two residential building types, this single family home, it's a 2000 square foot raised bungalow and this multi-unit building that's a 10,000 square foot, four story, eight unit little MERB. And I gathered together uh, these documents called environmental product declarations or EPDs. And they're sort of like a, a report card or a nutrition label for products, in this case, building materials and uh, they tell you what the, uh, the emissions associated with creating those materials would be. And I use those figures because EPDs are generated by uh, an international ISO standard. So the way that that, that information gets assembled and the, the rules for doing that are common. And then EPDs are also a, a third party verified system. So it's not just manufacturers putting this information out, it's that information is being is being verified by a, uh, a third party. So you, you know that you're getting uh, relatively good information. And what I did was I, I, I assembled as many EPDs as I could for all the building materials I could feasibly use for these buildings in uh, here in Ontario. And I very quickly realized that that four different results could emerge here. Um, because in every category, whether I was looking at foundation materials or cladding or roofing or insulation, whatever it happened to be, there are always materials that were at the high end of the spectrum. And so you'll see I've kind of characterized those with, with the color red uh, through, the, uh, through the presentation here. Then there was kind of like a, a mid-range moderate emitter uh, group of materials and that's that I've used blue. And then yellow is for the the materials with the lowest carb category, but that are code compliant and widely available and, uh, and, and sort of something accessible to everybody. And then the final model was uh, in green and that was just finding the lowest carbon materials, even if they uh, aren't common or aren't manufactured in North America or uh, would be considered sort of alternative materials. 
And so I'm going to quickly show you what those models look like. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. So this is the, the high carbon footprint materials. So for the, the, that four-story MERB, I essentially just did a material takeoff. And then, so I had material quantities for the building. And then I took the global warming potential from those environmental product declarations and just got results for uh, all the materials that went into basically the, the enclosure of the building. So foundation, walls, roof, insulation, windows, and the major fin interior wall cladding, flooring, and ceilings. And when you add everything up for that little building, there's over 200 tons of emissions that come from the manufacturing of the materials to make this building. So this, uh, you know, pretty recently, this was invisible. Like when we talked about zero carbon buildings or zero energy buildings, we were ignoring this completely. But if you think about 200 plus tons of emissions coming from every single building that we build, um, there's just no way to meet any uh, climate change targets if, if we have emissions at that scale for every building. And you can also see a quick scan of that list of materials. These aren't, these are common materials. Like I'm, you know, I wasn't just making some academic model to, to prove a point. You know, there are lots of people using all of these materials to, to make buildings of this type. So the next model is sort of the moderate one. And so, you know, I did things like uh, adjust the, the mix for the concrete, um, substitute uh, different cladding and framing and finished materials. Again, lots of really common materials, nothing here that you, know, you would consider out of the ordinary. But just by paying attention to the carbon footprint of the materials, we've gone from 212 tons down to 68, which is, you, know, you could never achieve that kind of savings from operational energy. It would take you, you know, 150 years to, to see that kind of carbon reduction. And here you can do it upfront just by choosing materials uh, with a bit of knowledge uh, about what those materials, uh, what their emissions are. My next model uh, looks at the best possible materials that are conventionally available. So here again, I've adjusted the concrete mix to use um, high SCMs. So that's things like slag and fly ash in the concrete. And then here's the first place in the study where um, we're seeing some negative numbers and that's because materials like cellulose insulation and wood fiberboard in the case uh, right here in this graph. There are plants that, that took CO2 out of the atmosphere when they grew. And so they actually have a, a sort of negative carbon footprint. There's more CO2 taken out of the atmosphere in the material than was emitted in making the material. So you'll see in this model that some of the materials make the numbers go up, some make it go down. But at the end here, this building actually has 15 tons of net carbon storage. So even though a bunch of the materials are emitting materials, we put enough carbon storing materials in the building that the net effect is, this really is a zero carbon building also from the point of view of the materials, not just its energy use. And then the final model, this kind of tracks with the, the sort of building we do here at Endeavor where we use uh, a lot of plant-based materials. In this model, you'll see there's a, uh, a lot of straw-based and, and, uh, and waste fiber uh, materials put in here. But if we build that way, we can actually get a building so that it has uh, 117 tons of net carbon storage. So um, a, a huge difference in between all of these models, like the, the step between all of those different models is a, is a massive change in emissions. So those, those those materials that, that seem to magically uh, make the numbers go down, they're basically your plant-based materials. So, you know, the common ones are things like timber, cellulose, uh, less common, well, even common ones like bamboo, cork, things like that, that you could, you know, already buy at the store, but other things like straw and hemp and mycelium and a whole bunch of other materials that are sort of, uh, you know, just starting to uh, make their way onto the market. All of those things, all of those plants grow by pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so the dry weight of any plant material is 40 to 50% carbon that came out of the atmosphere. So you've got that drawdown, then you've got some emissions that go back into the atmosphere from turning those things into building materials. But because the carbon drawdown is bigger than the emissions to make the material, you know, that's how you get these net carbon storing materials. So if you, if you think about this, you know, like an accountant 
all the materials you put into the building that have emissions, they're, they're your positive numbers, they drive your total up. And these plant-based materials are your negative numbers and they help bring the, the overall total down. And so I also wanna show you that model, the first model I showed you, so those four bars, that's the same thing we were just looking at, those four different building types. That was modeled as though the building was just meeting uh, Ontario code minimum standards for energy efficiency. And then I remodeled them as though they were going to meet the, the net zero ready or sort of uh, code that's, that's on its way down the pipeline now. And the interesting thing that pops out here is that if the insulation materials we're using have a big carbon footprint, then as we try to make the building more energy efficient by adding more of that insulation, we actually put ourselves in a bit of a, a, a carbon hole or you know, we've, we've incurred a, a sort of carbon debt by adding more insulation that we have to be sure we're gonna make up that carbon debt um, if it's gonna be a worthwhile investment. Whereas if we up the insulation value with the carbon storing insulation materials, we've kind of got a win-win because we're gonna make the building perform better, which is gonna lower its operational emissions, but we've also put more carbon away into the building up front. So it's, it's starting as a, as a bigger carbon sink and then it's still gonna perform uh, at that net zero ready level. This is um, what those totals for that whole building look like if you convert them to, uh, to uh, emissions per meter squared, which is a much better way to kind of compare between buildings. And you can see, you know, that range is really wide. And what I want to do with this slide is just, you know, make it clear that, that these four buildings aren't, this isn't a prescription that you have to build this way or this way or this way. This is just to kind of show that in the same way that a designer can go about setting an energy target for a building, you can decide you're going to meet Energy Star or you know, R2000 or Passive House, you set a target and then you go about meeting it and you can treat the material carbon footprint the exact same way. You want to design a zero carbon building, make zero the number here and you know, mix and match the materials until you get there. You want to have a 50 kilogram per meter squared building then mix and match the materials until you get there. So it's not, it's not like a one size fits all approach. It's, it's just another uh, metric that you kind of stir into the pot. Um, but you, know, you can obviously make a, a huge difference in, in the, uh, the climate impact of the building by, by paying attention to this. And then the last part I'm gonna throw at you here is to add operational energy to this mix. So, you know, the graph is the one we just looked at with the code compliant four different models on the left and the net zero ready on the right. So that's the emissions from the materials we're looking at. And then we add 30 years of natural gas operations to that building. So we ran an energy model on the building and because they were all built the exact same way or to the same standard, um, they all have 300 tons of emissions or 10 tons a year associated with the natural gas emissions from heating that building. If you make it uh, a net zero ready building, if you improve the energy efficiency, you drop that to 240 tons. So you've made a really important 60 ton reduction uh, on the footprint of that building over 30 years. Super, like we need to do that, that's great. But like I was saying earlier, here's this opportunity, even just between one model from this study and the next, the opportunity to drive down emissions is basically double what it is uh, to address the energy efficiency. So if I change my materials, so I'm no longer building with the materials I use for this red building and I move to this blue one, that's a 144 ton reduction. That's more than twice the reduction value I'm getting from making the building more energy efficient. And I don't at all want you to leave here saying, well, Magwood said, don't make your building energy efficient, just make better materials. That's not what I'm saying uh, because you know, our best model does both. You, you really need to be thinking about these two things hand in hand. And you know, way over here on the far right, good materials and a really energy efficient building, I can build this building and operate it for 30 years with a carbon footprint that's only a little bigger than just making this blue building and is less than half the size of just making this red building. So you put both these things together, energy efficiency and good materials, and now you're really sort of uh, talking in terms of 
making an impact. I'm going to skip that one for uh, for the benefit of time. So the last model I'll show you here is the same. It's the same energy model, but we've substituted an air source heat pump on the Ontario electrical grid. And you can see that the fuel switching um, results in a much lower operational carbon footprint. And that's really interesting because as we clean up our, our, our energy sources, it means that the, the materials are going to become a bigger and bigger piece of the overall emissions for the building. So you can see that red one, uh, the materials represent, you know, better than four times what 30 years of operations look like. And also you can see on the net zero ready side that as you start dealing with cleaner energy, reducing the energy use of the building doesn't have the same impact on the climate. So, you know, we've, we've dropped only a few tons over 30 years. And again, not to say we shouldn't be making them energy efficient because for all the things Doug's talked about, comfort, you know, performance, cost, all of those things, we want to make the energy efficient building, but it's not going to uh, necessarily be for the climate. And in fact, when I talked about that early carbon debt, here's what happens. This red building, you can build the building to code minimum and heat it for 30 years. And it actually has less of a climate impact than if I take that same building and up the performance, um, you're just not seeing the difference. So I'm, I'm raising this because, you know, a lot of people out there are, are focusing on energy efficiency because they want to make a difference to the climate. And what I want to say here is make sure you're actually having that difference. Cause if you're just pursuing the energy efficiency, you may not actually be, be helping the climate. But I also want to point out that, you know, over here at the far right, you know, both the yellow and the green building, these are buildings that, that essentially don't have any carbon footprint. The yellow one is about a ton a year and the green one is gonna be net carbon storing for over a century. So, you know, this is the place that, that we as builders can, you know, easily get to where, you know, we're not just doing less bad, but we're actually sort of doing more good for the climate by, by building buildings. So I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, I really would encourage you to uh, think about adding these two things together. You know, if you're, if you're thinking about your building's impact on the climate, you absolutely need to think about the operational side, but you really need to add the material side uh, in, order to, uh, in order to make that work. Uh, and I'll quickly touch on this really great project that I'm working on right now uh, with the folks at Enercan. So this is a calculator that's going to uh, allow you as the builder to, to get these kind of figures for your building as you're doing the design. So essentially uh, in this calculator, you put in your, your gross building dimensions into the calculator. And what you get is for every part of the building. So we're looking at the foundation wall here. You get every option that you could use to make that uh, part of the building. And in real time, you see what its carbon footprint is going to be. So you know if you're going to choose the, um, you know, the ICF or the, 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 the CMU or the poured concrete, you can right away see what the, the, the impact of that's going to be. You sort of check the box of the material you're going to use and it goes, it sort of adds a running total for your whole building. So this means you're, you're able to kind of generate that data that I'm just showing you from those model buildings for your own building in a, in a pretty quick and, and easy way. And then when you've worked your way through all the different materials, the calculator is going to show you what your gross carbon footprint is and what it is per, per square meter of building. So uh, hopefully really great information uh, that you'll be able to get and, uh, and Enercan is going to be looking to alpha test that uh, with some builders uh, in the upcoming year. So really excited to be, to be part of that. And I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, it might seem like a crazy big jump to get yourself into that green type carbon storing building right away, but you don't need to, you know, it's really easy to just get away from doing the worst possible building, you know, stop making the buildings that are uh, in that red zone and get yourself into the blue zone. That's a super easy jump. There's no, there's no cost. There's no, um, there's really no barriers to doing that. And there's really hardly any barriers, if at all, to getting into that yellow zone. So, you know, this is something that you can think about, phase out, um, experiment with, you know, material replacements one at a time, you know, however you want to approach it. But, you know, just know that it's approachable 
and uh, and that you know if you go down that path, you're going to make a really big difference for the climate. And Thank I you. Think, yeah. Um, I was just going to say, I know we're running a little bit over, so I just wanted to address the the audience. Uh, this is all going to be recorded, and so or it is recorded, so uh, we will share that information with you in the event that you do need to uh, to leave. But uh, anyways, go ahead, Doug. Well, I uh, first of all, I want to really thank everybody for for being on, and if they have to jump off, then I, I totally appreciate it. It's been a, a fascinating conversation today, and and I, I really. Chris, I, I just I, I, I want to say thanks to the audience. Hopefully, you can stick around. If you can't, uh, again, thanks to our sponsors. I'll do that again in a few minutes. But I do have a couple of questions I wanted to go through with you. So the first is: is wood good? Now, I I, I, I would always have thought it was, but um, you know, comparing to concrete and steel, how does wood fit? And can you maybe explain the benefits of selecting FSC products? Sure. I mean. In a, in a pretty straightforward comparison, wood has less carbon emissions than concrete or steel for sure. Um, so that, that comes across pretty clear when you, when you run these models. The, the bigger and thornier question is, can you actually count wood as carbon storage in the way that I was you know, making those numbers negative for plant-based materials? And in almost all of those models I showed you, I didn't count the carbon stored in wood because that's a much harder question to answer because it's not just a matter of, you know, there's X number of kilograms of carbon molecules in my two by four, the, 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 the impact of wood on the climate, you sort of have to look at the whole forest level. Like if, if I'm clear cutting forests to put wood into buildings, then yes, there's carbon stored in the building, but I also eliminated this huge carbon sink off the face of the planet. So it's not, the math isn't quite uh, straightforward. So, the, you know, the, the, the recommendation for FSC or it could be SFI or other, you know, sustainable harvesting program is that wood is best if, because we're harvesting it to, to use it as a building material, we're managing the forest in a way that the carbon sink in the forest increases. And so those programs are sort of intended to ensure that, you know, our wood stocks grow instead of shrink. And so if you're getting certified wood um, you're, you know, you're less likely to be contributing to practices that are reducing the amount of, of carbon sink in forests on the planet. Real quick, um, my home is a tree, so I started using the graphene stone primer plus at Ductory Homes. According to their website, three buckets of this primer absorbs the same amount of carbon as a 250 kilogram tree during its cure time. That's about two years. That helps offset the manufacturing, uh, the carbon footprint from manufacturing. At 150 homes a year, how does that compare to, say, a typical primer? Um, it's much better. Uh, I haven't I haven't run the numbers, uh, but you know the the paints paints weren't part of my study, but I did I did look at paints, and uh, there there for that merb, there's about 10 tons of emissions associated with giving that building its its first uh, round of paint inside, wow. and so. Uh, my my sort of assumption would be the difference between that and and the paint you're talking about the graphene stone is it's probably a factor of at least ten so uh, there's that's a, significant a big, okay. a big difference there uh, some low hanging fruit then I guess would be uh, the the, uh, the the blowing agent uh, going from uh, HFC to HFO uh, that's a big reduction for the foam I know it's not perfect but it's starting to get us maybe in the right direction. Maybe offsetting that using blown cellulose in the attic, and uh, maybe consider s some carbon absorption materials. Those are some instant steps that we could look at taking, right? Yeah. Okay. Very cool, uh, Steph. I think you're into your last question, maybe. Yeah. So, um, what we wanted to know. In, in one of the questions uh, kind of alluded to this. Uh, so we're starting to hear about, you know, carbon reduction and that sort of thing. So we wanted to know um, if stakeholders that uh, are in your area are in, in with your work are asking you about carbon reduction. And so we've listed a few like municipalities, uh, regulators, clients, investors. Uh, but if you're having anyone outside of that, uh, just put some your thoughts in the chat section so we can hear um, other other stakeholders outside of that. 
Well, this is an interesting result. Uh, we're still, it's still early uh, in the polling here. So um, we've only got about 25 respond, 25% uh, of the respondents so far. So I'll give them a little bit more time. Folks may have started jumping off too, though, except we're running a bit long, right? Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. But we still have 130 on, so uh, most well, people. Thank I, you, everybody, for hanging in there. Yeah, I think uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, your uh, your presentations are interesting and tons of questions. We got 11 questions, so I think we'll probably have to tackle those, uh, sending them out afterwards. But okay, so about 40% of the respondents. Uh, so I'll share this result. Um, interesting clients. Are wow. The number one. wow. Yeah. That's great to see. Yeah. Very cool. Interesting. Very cool. All righty. Uh, so to takeaways from today, uh, build your team carefully and build it early. What's your water management air tightness plan? Uh, the changing of your paradigm, consider total value contribution. And as you plan your specs, consider kick, comfort, IAQ, carbon, and climate. So uh, one last go around to thanking our sponsors, our, our webinar series sponsor, Enbridge. A very quick note uh, with Enbridge that these folks are starting to look at uh, using geothermal uh, with their source or ground source heat pump, I should say. And so, you know, Chris, your research, I think, is going to be incredibly important to be sharing with them. High, high value that they're on the right track with what they're doing there. And we're really looking forward to starting to pilot some of that with them. Uh, webinar uh, series co-sponsor, uh, building knowledge with Steph as my co-pilot. Steph, thanks for guiding me through this today. Really appreciate it. Again, origin idea was Patrick at Entercan. Uh, this wouldn't even be happening if he hadn't basically chatted me into it. Uh, to my tolerant employer, Doug Terry Holmes, thanks for the time to let me do this. And to my understanding partner, Carolyn at Graffenstone, uh, the love of my life. And, uh, you know, I, I am uh, very pleased to continue the journey with her that we've had for so many years and to thank her for her patience and support of me. Uh, and that puts us into Q&A stuff. So I, I will leave it with you at that point as to what we do next. Well, you know what, since we're almost 15 minutes over, <laughs> so I'm thinking that maybe what we'll do is I'll send you the questions uh, uh, that, are, that are in the Q&A and then uh, what you can do is uh, respond to them. So send them and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll send those out. So uh, yeah, so I will send you an email uh, to everyone with uh, the PowerPoint slides for both Chris's presentation and Doug's presentation. And there were a number of links that we, we had discussed. So I'll send those out as well. Um, the questions will have to come later. Uh, the question and answers will have to come later. Uh, but because the session is recorded, I'll send you the link uh, with that information. There, there should be a Survey Monkey link that pops up when I close the session today. Uh, but if uh, for some reason it doesn't, I'll include the survey link because uh, survey monkey link because we'd like to get your feedback. A big thank you, like Doug said, to Enbridge, to Doug, to Chris uh, for your for your sponsorship and for your uh, participation, Doug and Chris. Uh, that is excellent. This is a four part series, so he's working his way through the book. Uh, so make sure if you haven't already to um, sign up and register for the next three sessions, the 12th, the 17th, and the 24th, because they're all different webinars. Uh, and, uh, and then we will see you then. And uh, also, uh, we will take the email list uh, that we get from the attendees and uh, send you information on the book once it's ready. So that's all I have, Doug. Well, a big shout out to uh, Chris for jumping on with us today. That was really fascinating to hear. And uh, and so gosh darn timely. I'm, I'm really happy we were able to add that in. Next week, we're going to be having a special guest, Will Beardmore, to talk about solar panels on the roof and some do's and don'ts on that. Uh, it's a, it's a chock-a-block session again. I'm looking forward to it and hopefully uh, people found this uh, enjoying and a little bit entertaining. So thanks, Steph. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Doug, and hope everybody has a great week. We'll see you on November the 12th. Thank you. Bye. Do we stay on? Uh, no, we're going to go off. But if you would like, I can set up another meeting right now and we can chat.